Today, the unexpected happened. I turned 28. Aside from that, Twitter released the source code for their algorithm, which is pretty damn cool. It's all on GitHub now. It shows a lot of the inner workings of how Twitter recommends things on the homepage. While we don't have every detail, we don't have the search algorithm, we don't have all these other pieces, we do have a lot of what powers Twitter. And there are some interesting things in here. Also a lot of misconceptions. So let's take a look. So out in the world, in this area around here, we'll call this Tweetland. This is where all of the tweets exist. They all live out here. Some of these tweets are gonna come from sources that Twitter thinks are relevant to you. So step one is source relevant tweets. And this isn't like find 10 tweets you'll like. This is find a million tweets you might like. Relevant tweets is determined by a lot of different things. We'll go into that in a bit. Relevant includes how recent was a tweet? Do you follow the person? Are they talking about things that you talk about? But first, a set of relevant tweets is found. From there, those relevant tweets are ranked. So step two is tweets are ranked. They're ranked by a bunch of different things. We'll go into all of that as well in the future. But once this pool of millions of tweets is found, so I'll even put like one plus tweets. So this happens, the tweets are ranked. So they're basically split into chunks. So Cheats, or, so of these million tweets, they're sorted and chunked based on how likely you are to be interested in them. And whenever you interact with them or don't interact with them, it can adjust accordingly. Oh, there's only 1,500 tweets here? Cool, that's good to know. I'll say 1,500 tweets. So at this point, there's 1,500 tweets. Here they're split into chunks and organized based on like your likelihood of being interested. And then step three, and it's interesting this is at step three, but like it is a lot easier this way because you don't have to run the checks as often. Step three is filter out specific preferences. So this is like, I'll put another one of these in the corner here. This is like remove poor, or NSFW and blocked muted people. So these are the three steps. And at the end here, you get your little tweets on your phone or wherever else. And these are the tweets that based on these steps Twitter thinks are the most likely to be of interest to you. Tweets exist in Tweetland. Relevant tweets are identified in large buckets. They are ranked so we have smaller buckets and then they are filtered so you don't have the things you don't want. And then, and only then, do things start to appear on your phone. But how do we source relevant tweets? This is the first thing we need to break down into much greater detail. How relevant tweets are found. Twitter was actually pretty descriptive on this part in the engineering blog post. They described two different sources, in network and out of network. In the finding of relevant tweets, Twitter needs to have places to grab 1500 tweets from before it even starts ranking them. It has a handful of different sources that they detailed in the article, categorized into two groups, in network and out of network. These numbers are all rough. These are the numbers they shared in the article though. So in network means the people you follow and interact with. So if I'm following somebody and they tweet, it's very likely it will be pulled into that 1500 tweets that are being ranked. So it doesn't matter how many followers they have, how often we interact. The in network source is just pulling people from my network that I'm following. The other side though, this other 50%, 
this is the th side that feels a bit more like an algorithm where it's finding tweets from people that I'm not necessarily following. About 15% of the total of my recommended tweets are coming from out of my network, or not out of my network, about 15% of the tweets that I see on my homepage that come from the algorithm are coming from my social graph, which means people who have overlap in what I like and who I interact with. So if I reply to a tweet from Primogen and then Primogen gets a reply from someone else, it's more likely to show me that other person's reply. And if that person goes and replies somewhere else after that, I'm more likely to see that too. It also uses things like the overlap in my likes and interactions. So if one of Prime's fans and I both like three of the same tweets, they like a fourth tweet that I haven't seen yet, Twitter's more likely to show me that tweet. This used to be one of the heavier things, but it doesn't help as much with growth outside of a circle you're already in. So like the people you already interact with and talk to, but what you won't get is a great new user experience and you won't find things outside of your existing circle anywhere near as easily. This is where the embedding space comes in. Remember when you first opened your Twitter account and it asked, hey, what topics are you interested in? Okay, you should follow these 15 people. The goal there is for Twitter to know what spaces on the Twitter platform you may or may not be interested in so they can make recommendations based on that. And this is more and more the source of tweets on your homepage because this is how they can grow the platform as a whole. They detail this in here and they give the example of like, the pop circle has these people in it, the news circle has these people in it. So if there's a tweet doing really well in the pop circle and Twitter thinks you might be interested in pop, they can show you that tweet. And if you like it, maybe they'll show more. And if you don't, maybe they'll show less. But it's a way for Twitter to expand the groups you interact with on the platform, helping the likelihood that you use the platform increase. This is just the first step though. And this is just how we find relevant tweets. Also things like how recent the tweets were obviously factors in when tweets are being thrown into this funnel, but this is just how they get in the top. Most of the tweets that get sourced here will never be seen by you, but some percentage of them will. So once we have these tweets that Twitter has determined are potentially with an interest to us, it has to take that pile of tweets and rank them, well, score them based on the likelihood that I'm interested. Twitter has this crazy algorithm. Basically, we go through each tweet and we ask some questions. So let's just list some of the types of questions we would ask. We'll take this first tweet. And we'll go through for each question. Does this user interact with the author a lot? Let's say they do. This is like my best friend and I tweet with them a lot. Okay, we'll double the size of the circle. Have I seen a lot of their tweets recently? Yes, I have. Okay, maybe we don't need to keep seeing more of them. We'll shrink this. Do we have a lot of interest? Oh, we do. I talk about the same things as them and I look at their, we both talk about React a lot. Okay, make this way bigger. Are they a blue subscriber? Oh, they are. Cool. We can make this even bigger. And then eventually we get a score for this tweet. And we'll take this next one. Okay, does this user interact with the author a lot? Yes. Have they seen their post recently? No. Is this tweet about something that they like? Oh, maybe this one's about Scala and I only talk about React, so I'm not interested. Okay, smaller. Are they a blue subscriber? No. Okay, even smaller. And we have how likely this one is to be recommended. And you can go through each of these tweets and they are different things and they're all multipliers is the key. So you can get to any point in here and you have like, four out of a hundred points, but then you hit a 50 point multiplier and now you're maxed out. So at any point, any of the many things that we can't see are going to multiply or are going to multiplicatively increase or decrease the likelihood you see a given tweet. So let's say this is how these all come out to. These are now ranked based on Twitter's algorithms, best guess of your interest in these different things. But what if, I have this user blocked. What happens now? How do I keep this from getting in my feed? This, this person is bad. We don't want them in my feed. How do I prevent that? This is where step three in that funnel comes in. The filtering step. This one, I don't really need a diagram. Basically, it just goes through all of the things in that circle and checks to make sure it doesn't want to show them for you, to you. Oh, actually, I made a mistake. One of the questions I had in there here the, have I seen a lot of their tweets recently? That isn't factored in here. So this is just likelihood of interest here. This is just increasing scores. The decrease happens in the filter. So at this point, if I have words muted, if I've seen too many tweets from the same person, if the tweets aren't balanced enough, 
if I'm seeing things and not liking them over and over. Like let's say all of the things in network are tweets about tech stuff and I'm not interacting with tech stuff right now. I'm only interacting with music stuff. Maybe at this point it says, okay, Theo hasn't been liking music stuff lately. Let's filter that out. So it basically goes through this and it will reorganize. I've seen this one too much lately. So it gets ranked down. This one's a topic that we've muted. So it gets X'd out. It says you already engaged with this tweet. Twitter knows, oh, this is of interest to you. So we yoink this one way higher up. This one is someone you blocked. So this gets X'd. This one's an advertisement. Or they like paid for it to be boosted or something. So it gets snuck pretty high up as well. And then two is just normal. So once we have the rankings, we now can filter that into your feed. And that's how the algorithm works. There's a lot of interesting stuff in the source code, specifically this Twitter blue subscriber joke. That's not a joke. They actually do multiply based on that. To be fair, it does increase the likelihood the person's a real person. So I get why they can use that, but it's always funny to see a thing that says, oh, rank this higher because they're paying us. Regardless, this, this logically follows and tracks. There's nothing too surprising or terrifying in here. There's a bunch of tweets on Twitter. They have sources to find tweets that you'll like. Half of it's things that you follow, half of it's things that you don't. We collect a bunch of tweets. We rank them based on things their ML system tracks to guesstimate how likely you are to care about a tweet. And once we've ranked all of those, we go through and filter based on more specific preferences, like you've seen too much of a given user's tweets, or you have a person blocked, or you have a word muted. All of those types of things result in a feed that is, for the most part, things that you're generally going to be interested in. It is honestly really cool to get to see behind the curtain. There's a lot of people who suspect that these algorithms are evil and secretly coded to suppress your specific topics or ideas. And that's not the case. This is pretty basic stuff. And like most social networks work something like this. If you have worked on social networks or ranking systems before, nothing here should be super surprising. But if you haven't, I hope this was a helpful breakdown of how this stuff works. If you like this and want to hear more about different algorithms on social media platforms, I have a thorough breakdown of how the YouTube algorithm works. I'll pin that in the corner here. So if you haven't already watched it, you can give it a shot. Put a lot of work into that one and we had a lot of fun diagramming it. So check it out if you haven't. Thank you as always. And peace, nerds.